Um, so the recording has started. Thank you. I'm just going to just quickly talk about Access Lab 2022. And just a reminder that the, the lab stands for laboratory. Um, and we came up with this idea, a colleague Kieran Prince came up with this idea that the, the concept is it's an opportunity to stop and reflect and think and experiment and challenge ourselves and challenge each other um, and think about ways of doing things differently or better. So I have got my trusty notepad and pen. Um, hopefully throughout the course of this afternoon and all the sessions, I will hear things that stop me and make me stop, think. Um, and by the end of the sessions, I'll be in a position where I can do things better or differently. That's the kind of the plan and the hope. So as I move uh, the screen forward, um, just a reminder to everybody, we are recording the sessions and these will be made available to everybody after the event. Um, if you do have questions, please post the speaker questions uh, in the Q&A and any general queries or conversations or ideas, please feel free to post those in the chat. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our uh, media sponsor, Research Information. Now, I went on their website site earlier uh, today to check to see if Tim was still their editor. I don't, I don't know if Tim is listening. We might listen to a recording. Tim, um, the editor, I met him a few times, usually in the margin of those face to face events around a coffee table or at an exhibition stall. Um, so I was actually on the Research Information website earlier on today, just checking that Tim was still there, and it is packed full of interesting stuff. I was um, really pleasantly surprised to see a, a big smiling face of one of my colleagues, Jake, who'd uh, recently written an, uh, an article for Research Information. Uh, so thank you to our media sponsors, and I do urge you to go and have a look at the work that they're doing. And then just a reminder, um, that we will be sharing nuggets of interest um, at the, uh, the hashtag Access Lab 2022 on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Uh, my colleague Phil, I think, uh, will be listening in. Hello, Phil. Uh, we'll be listening in and posting thoughts, observations, questions as the day progresses. So feel free to seek out Access Lab 2022 and feel free to post and share and try and amplify our thinking so more and more people can get involved. So while you're all eagerly and enthusiastically searching out the Access Lab hashtag, I'll just move on to the the first slide. I'm delaying ever so slightly just because we did have a 10 past one start time on the agenda and I might be slightly early. But I think a couple of couple of minutes will be fine. All right, I'll kick off. So hello, everybody, again. Um, I'm John Bentley. I'm the Commercial Director for Trust, Identity and Access. Um, and this is an opportunity for, to, to share some of my learnings for a project I've been involved with for the last four months or so. Um, we undertook a discovery project to try and understand what lifelong learning actually means to different people and what the role of digital identity could play within lifelong learning. Um, and I'll just share with you some of the things that we've learned. And at the end, I'm going to take us to, and hopefully we'll end up in the Colosseum in Rome. Um, and hopefully by the end of this session, that will make perfect sense to you all. Um, just a very, very brief um, bit about me. Um, so I've been with Jessica six or seven years. Prior to that, um, I 
spent 20 years in commercial publishing and I work for brands such as the Economist Intelligence Unit, the Financial Times. I worked in financial publishing for organisations like Euromoney. I worked for computing. I worked for the British Journal of Photography. I spent a, a, a short time working on titles in, including rubber and plastic news. Um, and I loved working in business to business publishing because everybody who worked in their field was passionate about what they did and really, really eager to share um, the information and knowledge they had about those different sectors. Uh, and then I moved to Open Athens. Um, and again, that I felt very much that we're part of that, uh, that knowledge sharing space that sometimes referred to as the, the scholarly publication space. But actually, actually, Open Athens does spread beyond the scholarly world. Uh, and then recently, we've started working with the UK Access Management Federation, which is part of JISC. Uh, and JISC is a UK sector agency uh, whose mission is to empower, um, enable and elevate digital and data practice within the UK and further education field. So that's just a little bit about me, about Open Athens, UK management and JISC. And I will just focus on Open Athens. This is the Open Athens Access Lab. And our mission, as we articulate it, is to remove barriers to knowledge. Um, we're a purpose-driven mission, and we believe our mission is important. And just to explain a little bit about that access management proposition, it always starts with the people, it always starts with users, and those users could be students, they could be doctors, engineers, lawyers, uh, citizens, um, IT experts, and those people want to access digital stuff. And I use the word stuff advisedly because it's really, it's any, any sort of anything on the internet or the web or any cloud application that needs to be protected. Um, and we support and help those people who are uh, managing that access management. So that could be IT experts, it's librarians, it's publishers, uh, it's the owners of software platforms, it's developers. So it's those people who control that access management. Those are the people we interact with every day. Um, and the, the stuff can be software, data, books, journals, it could be videos, magazines, it can be expense platforms. Um, it can be Miro, it could be the, your, you know, your organization's intranet. It's how do you control access to that digital stuff? And what we do, you sign in and we help people move from resource to resource. resource. And it's not just one resource. One of the key things about um, Open Athens and other federated access management software is that we really manage that research experience. So you, you go to one place, and then with the help of your library and the help of the publishers, you can jump around from resource to resource on your learning journey. And that journey is always powered um, by your digital identity. And it is that verified identity that really enables the experience. And it's something that we um, usually perceive to be an email address, for example, or your username. But in fact, what's happening in the background is there is a, uh, a digital ID that is uh, powering that transfer of information. It's that ID, that uh, attribute or data point that allows the platforms to transfer you from place to place as seamlessly as possible. And one of the things that uh, Open Athens has been working on is our, our portal, My Athens. Now the whole purpose of My Athens is to connect a user to the portfolio of resources within an institution. And the relationship here is that the institution itself will curate, collect, and make their portfolio of services available, and then make that accessible to the user. But we were discussing this and we were thinking about this, and we thought, well, what happens if we think about this from the other direction? Could we actually connect a user to their institution's portfolio? So it is the user who is managing their access. And as that user um, travels over time or place, it is the user who is managing their access to the different portfolios within those different institutions. 
And that is where the thought came to us, which is, well, can digital identity enable lifelong learning? What role would a digital identity have in kind of going on, so that, that individual who's going on a journey um, for whatever reason, through their learning journey, how can digital identity help? And the three kind of things that were most obvious to, uh, to us is, hey, yes, it can, um, but that digital identity, it needs to be persistent. So that travels you with over, over time. And if you change your name or if you change your address, um, anything that can happen to you over a length of time, that identity needs to be carried with you. It needs to be portable. So in, in that, there's the, the concept of student mobility. So if, I, if I'm moving from place to place, from institution to institution, even from country to country, is there a way that you can carry that learning identifier with you? And it's very, very important to um, the teams in Open Athens. Uh, it needs to be privacy preserving. So that the data that is aggregated about you over time becomes immensely valuable, but also immensely personal. Um, and actually we need to make sure when we're building these systems, we need to make sure that privacy is built into everything that we, we are doing. So we started our discovery um, and this has been going on about for four months and we have been talking to uh, users, librarians, registrars, vice chancellors, principals of universities and of further education colleges in the UK. UK we've been talking to people overseas, um, we've been talking to government, we, um, we really cast the net very very wide and what was both interesting and slightly thrilling was that everybody was keen to talk to us when we framed the discussion in terms of lifelong learning. And we've had a number of really, really valuable and quite detailed conversations with um, experts in the field from a whole, a whole host of different institutions. Um, and the three things that we've learned, the first one is it's that combination of data and identity that is key. The second thing that the impact of, of a digital identity will be widespread and it works at a system or a policy level all the way down to that individual level that we were talking about beforehand. And ethics, government, regulation, so governance and regulation has to be embedded at every step. It's not something that you can do as an afterthought. You can't design and build your systems and your platforms and think, oh, they're great. Now let's figure out how, how to make sure that we, we protect the people or the privacy of the people who are using it. That ethics, governance and regulation has to be embedded at every step. So lesson number one, which is that data and identity combined together lead to insight. Now, so this is a diagram that I've seen uh, on, on Twitter. Um, so I did it, but it struck me as kind of very, very true in terms, you know, very simple, but very true. Um, and I've discovered it's a, it's a bit of a thing. So it wasn't just something that someone threw together. There's, you know, there's quite some serious thought behind it. It's called the DIKIW hierarchy. And that stands for data, information, knowledge, insight, and wisdom. Um, and wisdom, that might be kind of over egging it a little bit. Um, but I do think the point is when you pull all the information together, it, it does strengthen your understanding. So, so data, for example, is just the logs that these platforms collect. Um, so everybody who is moving from platform to platform, every single interaction is logged at some point. Now that data only really becomes or it increases in value if you're able to label it. So in terms of putting the information on it, so that is a log from platform A, this is a log from platform B, and immediately you're beginning to sort of pass the data to make some sense of it. Now, if you can join that, that data together, again, it becomes more powerful, so you can understand the journey from A to B, then you're starting to sort of get a, a relative concept of which data is which, and it's actually when you can add, and I think this is where identity becomes very, very powerful, so obviously it needs to be treated with care, but if you can start to inject 
identity, you start to get some really, really profound insights about who is doing what and how you can support or enable those people who use it, who are using our systems. And through our thinking, we look to the digital identity life cycle. So we broke it down into creation, assurance, provisioning, trusted networks, aggregation, and then output and impact. And the creation, and this was fascinating talking to, and we, we, we focused on learning providers. So that's LPs. Um, and this is about that process of enrollment. Um, and that first point of interaction with a learning provider or institution is probably one of the most important. And what we were hearing from during the pandemic, pandemic for example, is that enrollment had to switch to digital, it had to switch remote. And there are stories of people holding up their passports in front of a Zoom call or a Teams call or a FaceTime so they could actually prove who they were um, to get the level, necessary levels of assurance um, when they joined an institution. And that assurance is looking to find about yes, that person is who they say they are. And there's also a sense of actually that person has previously been on a journey. So if you take the use case of a student, for example, uh, post 16 education, they will have their qualifications there, they will have their certificates. And what the learning provider is trying to do there um, is pull that information together. And then once they've done this, and this was a key point for me in terms of my understanding of digital identity, once you've got that information in a database, once you've kind of verified and assured who it is, that's when the kind of the IT experts, the IT team get involved and they start the, what, what's the, I think this is a technical term, which is provisioning. So that's looking at who that individual is, what their role is within the organization. So again, if I look at a learning institution, it could be student, it could be lecturer, it could be uh, a member of the IT team and you create their username and password at this point. And then that username and password, all that data is, is passed into a cloud directory, most commonly in the UK, that would be Microsoft Azure. Um, and then once that's done, once you've got it in that cloud directory, then you can move on to the sort of the concept of federated access management. Um, you know, Open Athens builds a bridge into that cloud directory that allows that user to start moving across these different networks within a within a trust fabric. And I, we know, open answer, because we've spoken to IT experts and we speak to the librarians, and we know that there is a challenge and an opportunity to be able to bring that data together so it can start informing um, the access management, the controls, the permissions that, uh, that students uh, can use to access information. And uh, Adam Snook, I think, hello Adam, I think you're on the call. I always recall that you say, if we had the data, you could control access to information based on the size of people's feet. And that's only, only possible because you're getting that creation and assurance and provisioning right at that first point. So the trusted, uh, the data is aggregated, it's in a cloud environment, you're in that trust fabric, and then you can start moving around and that's when you can start aggregating information on people and the data is collected and it's processed across or within platforms to build value and insight. And so I suppose it's something that's very emblematic of that would be learning, the learning analytics platforms that I know are available. And once you've got all of this data, what do you do with it? Well, you can do reports and studies. Um, and there was, a, uh, there was an excellent presentation from Russell Palmer from Galileo with Amanda from EBSCO the other week at ERL, I think that was, where they, where they were showing the value of that, of that data and that insight, which was helping them to inform um, you know, just make tackle, tactical decisions about what they could do next with their library portfolio. And if I was going to simplify all of this down, it goes to, oh, there we go, data in. So this is that really binary. If you get the data in correctly, the data that comes out um, will also be more accurate. I was kind of thinking it's a bit like a butterfly effect. Maybe you, know, you, get, you get one data point could be wrong and that could be magnified and exacerbated across the whole sort of digital identity life cycle. So for identity to work within the concept of lifelong learning, you really, really need to focus in on those inputs. Where are those inputs happening and how are they shared? Because the impact is widespread. It can go from a system 
to an individual level. And just to explain a little bit more about um, what I mean by that, the system level could be government. Um, and it's government talking to employers, um, but they are making those policy decisions about how we, how we fund, how we support learning within our countries. And then you're talking about the learning providers. So that's colleges, schools. Um, again, they can make use of, of that data. And then the individual itself who comes out with all the, the, the skills that they need. And then certainly in the context of our discovery, it's very much, very much focused on um, employers. So that's a sort of within the UK, there's the skills agenda, the leveling up agenda. You know, how do we get more green skills into the economy? How do we get more digital skills? How do we get more engineers, doctors, librarians, and or publishers? And just a little note about the scope of our project. As I said at the beginning, we cast the net really broadly, but it, it certainly became very clear, although lifelong learning and that persistence and that portability can and should be global, given the time that we had and the focus of GIST, we really, really did focus in on the UK and we focused in on post-16 education in the UK. But while we were doing this process of discovery, um, we found that the, obviously the concepts and the challenge, the concepts and the ideas that we were discussing are universal. We looked at uh, SURF, which is the, the Dutch NREN, um, you know, and they're, they're ahead of us. They've been thinking about this for, for a long time. They have their own set of EduID principles, personal, the user in charge, usable for life, even after graduation. It needs to be privacy friendly. Um, and needs to be enriched with other education related matters. Um, and it's one of those, you know, it's a good moment. It's one of those wonderful moments when you're on your journey and you find a common traveler who has already been there and actually validates your ideas and your learning. So um, yeah, the, the Netherlands are ahead of us. We looked at Finland, for example. I don't know if anyone from Finland is on the call, um, but they have a identity, a, an identifier that, that travels with them from their, their first steps into education. So literally um, at, it's, at sort of year, age four or five. And that, that identifier is a, like a health identifier. It's common to maybe a social security identifier, but in Finland, it travels through them, through their life. So they always have a record of what they've done, what they've learned. And that really does inform what else they could be learning out into the future. Um, and obviously, I, I just wanted uh, to mention Geont. Um, so that European partnership of, of education networks um, and their big project about student mobility. So that is something that is definitely happening. Um, and it's how do you connect? How can digital identifiers or a common identifier connect all these different systems? But because of the scope of our uh, project, we focused in on the UK and the home nations. Um, and I think one of the reasons people were very keen to speak with us is because there is a big policy initiative from the UK government at the moment about lifelong loan entitlement. And that's how can the government, so it comes back to that systems and the policy level, how can that government fund and support learners through their journey? And what they're looking to do is, is to, to fund people post 18 and, and they will give you the equivalent of four years of post-18 edu post education funding. And it can be used flexibly and it can be used over time and it can be used across different institutions as well. So that's where we started encountering the concept of micro uh, credentials or, or a modular stackable learning framework. Um, and again, for that to work, it requires a digital identity because one of the challenges they've got is that you need to get the uh, the plumbing right. There's an article in the UK magazine, Wonky, which talks about the plumbing. Um, if you don't get the systems right in the background, um, it will be very, very challenging to distribute that funding because what you're trying to do is attach the credits to the lifelong learning identifier and you're tying it to the individual, not the institution. And it comes back to, if you remember, looking at that kind of initial My Athens challenge is that learning portfolio 
And in the same way, the funding in the UK is tied to the institution or the individual. So actually what you're trying to do is entirely flip 180 degrees the, the data hierarchy. Um, and obviously that is very, very challenging. And also comes while you're focusing on that person, you become into the realms that it's, it's, it has to be treated sensitively. Um, so this is where we walked in and sort of did some discovery around ethics, governance and regulation. And obviously you encounter GDPR and I couldn't remember what GDPR stood for. I, you know, it was at the top of every single to-do list a few years ago and I was horrified. So just a reminder, general data protection regulation and the core principles stand uh, as true today as they were when it was all, it was all written a few years back. Um, and I think the one I'm going to pull out, that third bullet out there, it is limited to what is necessary for those purposes. And the whole concept is privacy by design. And it comes back to that point. You need to embed the thinking about what you're doing with this very, very sensitive data right at the beginning of the process. And one of the experts I spoke to was a colleague, Andrew Comic, oh, excuse me, Andrew Cormack who is a colleague within JISC. Uh, and he, he, he's an expert, it turns out, on identity and federated access management. Um, but he's progressed and he is now one of the sort of um, the critical thinkers, the, the, that sort of thought leader in the area of ethics and artificial intelligence uh, within JISC. And he's written a, a, a paper called The Pathway Towards Responsible Ethical AI. Uh, published at the end of last year and he says there's a series of, of questions that you should ask yourself um, when you're en entering into this realm of data and algorithms and identity and it's, it's cultural does it will it fit your institution um, do you have the the knowledge and the systems in place to make that work um, and then <laughs> I mean, essentially algorithms and artificial intelligence is based on data. And there is a bias inherent in that, that input of data. So you need to really be conscious and aware that when you're collecting and processing it, processing the data, um, are, you, are you doing it um, responsibly, I suppose? And then in terms of the, the detail, you need to have a framework or a regulatory framework in place to make sure that all that data that you're collecting will be used um, responsibly. So that's, and, that, and that's kind of in terms of the ethics, it, it, it does kind of boil. If you put rubbish in, if you're not uh, aware of what you're doing, you'll get rubbish out, that really binary piece. Because um, ultimately it is all about the user. It's all about the learner. That's I think why certainly I work in this space. I think a lot of people on this, uh, this meeting will work in this space because we're enabling people to be the best versions of themselves, if you like. Um, you've got that journey from starting your learning, going through um, to your academic career, or any, in fact, any post-16 um, work. I mean, certainly in the UK, there's an increasing focus on apprenticeships. Um, and then also that, that post-work life. Um, just uh, just popped into my head. There's also an observation that we're realizing that in fact, employers are becoming one of the key deliverers of learning and training. And that's just another variable uh, in, in the equation. But if you remember when I started, I said I was going to end up at the Colosseum in Rome. And I started about talking about myself. I'm going to finish by talking about myself because actually my, my parents, uh, very lucky that I've both got them. They're still, they're in their late 70s now. Uh, and they started um, studying for uh, a GCSE. So that's a, a UK qualification, uh, sort of a level three qualification. They started studying Italian. Um, and I think that's, for me, that's one of the key things about lifelong learning. You can, you can do it at any, any point in your life. Um, my mum, uh, sorry, my dad, was very successful. He got an A in his uh, GCSE A level. My mum got an A star. Uh, so well done, mum. Um, 
but that's it so those are my reflections on lifelong learning those are some of the lessons that i think i've learned during the last three or four months or so um hopefully today is also about learning we'll learn lots of new things during the uh, the, the sessions later on and i don't know if anyone has got any quite neil are you there neil i am here yes thanks Hello. thanks john for that that's a very interesting um presentation thank you um just just very quickly for those who haven't met me before i'm neil i'm the chief technical officer for the open athens area uh and i'm just going to spend the next i think we've got seven minutes um just uh passing over the questions for john to answer so the first one we've got john is from ali who's asked about orchid and what role orchid might play in yes, this space so, yeah so uh, we certainly looked at orchid we certainly had colleagues at jisc who work uh who I think run ORCID, or certainly part of that organization that runs ORCID. So that is the Open Research and Contributors ID. I think that, that's what that stands for. Um, and it is an example of a persistent identifier that validates the use of research. Um, so it can always be tied back to the appropriate individual. So we looked at ORCID. There are lots of lessons to be learned about, for example, the persistence of an identifier. Um, when I was talking to my colleagues about it, they were, you know, they were pointing out that you can change your name, you can change your gender, you can change. There's, there's so much about you can change over time, but you need to still tie, tie it back. We didn't investigate ORCID too deeply. We think it's something we will return to, but it was a, it was a question of scope. I think there are sort of 12 million ORCID identifiers uh, globally. And they're very, very much focused in on that research space. So one of the things we would hope to be able to do is if you think about that network of information, at some point, the ORCID identifier would be able to be merged or matched um, and become part of that, of those systems that allow people to aggregate information about themselves for themselves as they learn. There's a, there's a number in the UK, for example, which is the ULN, the unique learning number um, that most people in the UK are, uh, sort of given when they're about 14. We think that's probably the space we're going to be looking at um, within the UK. Thanks, John. A question from Jane. How do we ensure metadata required to access content is collated at the creation, assurance or provisioning stage? Oh, Ooh, that, well, that's... So that is a conversation, that is about collaboration, that is about communication, that is about people within the institution understanding that life cycle. Um, it's about the, the administrators uh, and the librarians or whomsoever talking to each other so they know where those pots of data are. It could be that an API or a, sort of a, a, a data download or a data upload into a single platform could help but you still need that common identifier to pull all that information together. We know that there are instances where, from our Open Athens experience, we know there are instances where an institution has got data in one place and the library wants to use that data to inform, uh, put access controls in place, but the only place they can do that is within the Open Athens uh, administrative area. So we've, we, you know, we've built, um, systems in an, an attribute management system for example that allows that data to be collated um you know it, but but if that happened further upstream if it happened higher up in that that life cycle we'd still be able to use uh, that that data to control access thanks john and, and when you when you talk about the lifelong journey learning journey yeah wh when do you envisage that journey starts well, so this goes back. So in Finland, well, if it, well, for an individual, it starts at any point. It's sort of as soon as you become conscious for it. I think Finland, I think there are other countries, was a really interesting example to us because it's, they started collecting data right at your, so the, it's the equivalent of reception or key stage one in the UK. And there's a huge amount of data that is captured about your your background your, your ethnicity your socio-economic background special ed education needs are often cap captured in those early stages and in the uk what seems to happen is a lot of that rich data is lost 
from that that jump to sort of post 16 education and actually so what's happening is the learning institutions are, 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 are just they're not able to track the progress of the people going through their institutions because they don't necessarily know the starting point even though that data already exists um and we think that might be sort of a cultural thing that within the uk and it might be the same in north america um there is a real reticence to share too much about yourself with the state so go figure so in in terms of um the lived experience lifelong learning starts as soon as you're conscious that you're learning but in terms of how how you as an individual how your identity is managed over time it probably in the uk i'm thinking it starts at about 14 or 15 when you're embedded into the system with a ulm okay thank you john yeah. Uh, we, we've got one more question from uh, Mula Geta. I hope I've pronounced her, her name right, which um, is probably going to be best answered by one of the sales teams. So Mula Geta, I'll, I'll get Adam Snook, one of our sales uh, team, to contact you on that question during the break, if that's okay. So I think that's it for this session. Um, so we're going to move to a break. Great, Johnny, good, everybody. It is... Uh... We're next for Open Athens with Dan Mayers in 10 minutes time or so. Thanks everybody for listening and thanks Neil for the questions. Thank you everybody. <laughs>